good afternoon. I'm so excited by the number that is in the room. Um, first and foremost, my name is Dr. Christy Kelly. I serve as the Director of Multicultural Student Services. And today is a very exciting day. Um, Mr. Joe Felice, who is our Senior Vice President of Student Services, uh, is going to introduce our guest speaker, who is clearly a historical figure. Um, in just a few moments, um, once we get our technological uh, settings straight, um, Joe will read to you Ms. Mendez's bio. Um, I had the pleasure of spending time with her this morning, and she's just a wealth of knowledge. Um, such a humble person. Almost brought me to tears, but that's not hard, so. <laughs> but um, I hope you enjoy our programming, and please know that this is in collaboration with the sociology department, who you will have an opportunity to hear from shortly from Dr. Jen Bunton. So in just a few moments, uh, we will get started with our programming. Thank you. I'll go ahead and, and read the bio as we're preparing for the uh, presentation, but I, I want to thank everybody for being here. This is an unbelievable crowd. I'm very, very proud that um, there are so many people here that I'm sure you're in for a treat. And, uh, it's good to see um, this kind of representation from our students, faculty, and staff. I'm here to welcome you on behalf of Dr. Livingston, our president, who uh, is with our executive committee of the board right now in the meeting. And so he sends his best wishes, um, and I also send my best wishes and appreciation to the Office of Multicultural Student Services and the Sociology Department for this, uh, what promises to be a very enjoyable, educational, and very noteworthy presentation. But it is my honor uh, to be able to read to you the background and bio of the civil rights activist, Sylvia Mendez. Civil rights activist, Sylvia Mendez, is the oldest daughter of Gonzalo Mendez, a Mexican immigrant, and Felicitas Mendez, a Puerto Rican who challenged segregation so that she and other Latino children could be provided the same quality education provided to white students. Her parents were plaintiffs in the landmark Mendez versus Westminster School District case in 1947 that paved the way for Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and ended school segregation in California. In 1943 in Westminster, California, students of Mexican descent were required to enroll in segregated and inferior schools known as Mexican schools. When Sylvia was in the third grade, she and her brothers, Gonzalo Jr. and Jerome, were denied admission to the white school near their Westminster home. The Mendez family, along with four other, with four other Latino families, fought to integrate the school. Mendez won in the federal court in 1946, then again in appeal in 1947, and helped make California the first state in the nation to end school segregation. Seven years later, Mendez served as a significant precedent for the NAACP in its U.S. Supreme Court school desegregation case, Brown versus Board of Education. Today, Sylvia continues the legacy left by her parents by fighting for quality education and by encouraging students to stay in school. Ms. Mendez, who still resides in Orange County, attended Cal State Los Angeles, earning a BS in nursing. She worked 33 years as a nurse at the Los Angeles USC Medical Center, becoming assistant nursing director of the pediatric pavilion. Since Ms. Mendez retired, she has traveled all seven continents and visited over 60 countries. Ms. Mendez and her family have received numerous awards and recognitions, including a U.S. Postage stamp commemorating the 60th anniversary of the appellate victory. Two public schools are named after Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez a Lifetime Achievement Award presented by the National Parent Teacher Association, the U.S. Congress Civil Rights Champion Award, two books written about the life of Sylvia Mendez and another about the lawsuit, and two documentaries, the Emmy-winning film Mendez vs. Westminster, For All the Children, Para Todos los Niños, by Sandra Robbie, and Mendez vs. Westminster, Families for Equality, by Erica Bennett. On February 15, 2011, 
President Barack Obama presented Sylvia Mendez with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Currently, Sylvia and her family are among the participants in the story of courage, the vision to end segregation, the guts to fight for it. This unique exhibition, which includes Para Todos Los Niños, for all the children, is at the Museum of Tolerance located in Los Angeles, California. Before Ms. Mendez comes up to talk, we're gonna, sh we're gonna show a short video, but I would like you to please join me in a tremendous honor of welcoming <coughs> Sylvia Mendez. We are very honored to have her with us today. I went to USC and I was speaking there, one of the 
Susan Slauson said that's not true, it's not a preceptor to Brown. And I knew it was because I learned, I sent everything to, to Sherman Marshall and Carter. And we were so lucky that the 100 black men out of Orange County sent the student that made this video. Sandra Roby to New York to talk to Carter, who was still alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. nationalities oh. that came together to end the germ segregation. And I was one of those students for which the lawsuit was fought, along with 5,000 Latinos at that time. But you can't believe how shocked I was when I started going around the country and found out that we were segregated now than we were in 1947 by the effect of segregation. What Brown and Mendes did was they got rid of segregation by law and by de jure. De jure segregation is by law. Now, well, now we have de facto segregation. So my story is the end of de jure segregation. I started in 1943 when my father, who owned the cafe, Decided to move to Westminster and take charge of the Minamito family. And you saw pictures of the Minamito family, which we were so grateful. It was horrible things that were happening during the war in Germany. Then here to our Japanese families that were taken into internment camps here in California and placed in internment camps. The Minamito was sent into post of Arizona and Mount Sonar, they could only take what they could carry. So when we went to the ranch to take care of it, we knew what an injustice was going on. And that fall, when we finally got there to that to the ranch, my father asked my aunt Sally to take us to school. And when we got there, we were told we could stay there, but my my cousins who were very light skinned, and I tell the students when, when I go and speak, Latinos come in all colors. Dark like me and very light with light eyes, blue eyes. Back to Helen. Butter here that has very light eyes. <laughs> so that the 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 clerk said, Sorry, you can leave your children here, but your brother's kids will have to go to the and I would tell the students, she did a Rosa Parks stand, but she said, no, I am not leaving my children here. And you will hear from my brother tomorrow. So she gathered us all up. I was eight years old. I really don't, don't remember, except that all of a sudden we couldn't go to school. Was We went home and my aunt's telling my dad, you can't believe what happened. They won't allow your children there. And he says, Day. Tomorrow I'm going to go speak to the principal. We live right next to the school. How can we not be going to that school? And so he went to the principal. I said, Mr. Mendes, I'm sorry, but Mexicans can't come here. So he went to the superintendent of schools, and then he finally and told him the same thing. He went to the superintendent of schools in Orange County, and he said, there's certain cities at this time that have built schools for the Mexicans and minorities. And one for the whites, and that was Garden Grove, Orange, Santiago, and Westminster. And your children will have to go to that Mexican school. My father said, I'm not taking them. He says, You know, by law, if you don't take them, you go to jail. So you have to take them. So my father became very upset and decided to hire a lawyer. Somebody told him, You know what, Gonzalo? There's a lawyer called Marcus, and he just fought a case in Riverside where they wouldn't allow the Latinos to go into the public park. Can you believe we weren't allowed to go into the public park? It's a swimming pool. And he just won that case in 1944 in Southern California. He won it by the 
but uh, the judge saying it was a violation of the 14th Amendment. So that's how he wants that case. On my second 1945, my parents sent the four other families, William Guzman, Frank Palomino, Tomas Estrada, and Lorenzo Ramirez filed a lawsuit in the federal court in Los Angeles seeking an immediate injunction against segregation of students in Orange County. On February 18, 1946, the court found in favor of the five plaintiffs. And what did the school board do? They appealed it. They appealed it to the Ninth Circuit Court. But in that, on April 14, 1947, you saw what the judges said at the end of the video. The U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals unanimously upheld the Ninth Circuit Court's decision. And I, along with thousands of other minorities, started going into integrated schools. That was in 1947. To tell you, I thought I, I I did go to court every day, and I sat right there next to the judges, never thinking of what they were fighting for. I thought they were fighting for me to go to that beautiful school, the white school that had these monkey bars and swings, and the, the bus would pick us up. We lived in an angle section, pick up all the little angle children and my, and my brothers and my cousins and I, stop, Right at the playground in the white school, beautiful white school. The angle children would go into the white school, and my cousins and I would have to walk blocks into the middle of the school. So all this time I'm thinking, they're fighting so I can go into that playground, that beautiful playground, never realizing what they were fighting. I have to tell you, everyone here, that the integration in California went very smooth. Nothing like what happened to Ruby Bridges. Nothing like what happened in Central High in the South. It was very smooth. What they did in Westminster, they put the older kids in the in the Mexican school, the younger ones in the white school. The Anglo parents got very upset for their children to be in that horrible school, and they closed down. And we all went in. That was with the that was before the appeal. Then the appeal came, and. Uh, the Japanese came back, the war ended, and we went back to Santa Ana. And when we got there, we were still in during the appeal. And my dad said to the superintendent of school, I'm taking my child, children to the white school. And, and they didn't say anything. So when I got there to that school, we got there to that school, the teacher knew that we were coming there very nice in this. And the teacher said, Hi, Sylvia. And I said, Hi, everybody. We had already been integrated in Westminster by Nana Saniana. So I thought it was going to be really nice. So I'm sitting up. So the school bell rings. We have a uh, recess. And the school bell rings. And we go out to play. And this little white boy comes up and says, What are you doing here? You're a Mexican. You don't belong here. What are you doing here? Don't you know Mexicans aren't allowed in this school? You won't believe what happened. I started crying and crying. I can't believe it. I started crying. I said, his mother, I go home that day. I said, mother, they don't walk in that school. I'm not going back to that school. She said, Tina, can you tell me what they were fighting for? Aren't you aware of what we were fighting for? Yes, so we can go to that beautiful school with that beautiful playground. She says, no, Cynthia, that's not what we were fighting for. We were fighting because under God, we all deserve to be treated equally. And we all deserve to have justice and equal education. And of course, you're going back to school. And of course, I went back to school. And what did I discover? I discovered that we're not born with hatred in our heart. We're not born with prejudice in our heart. We're not born as bigots. Because before you know it, I was seeing it. I went to their home, to their party, and I grew up in an integrated school system there in Orange County after that. And it wasn't until my mother asked me to go around speaking about this uh, that I started going around the schools talking about Mendes versus Westminster. So in the Mendes case, I have to tell you, there was definite mix of people coming together to help. The, the lawyer, the, the banker that helped my dad get Lisa Minamiso uh, farm, the, uh, the lawyer that was Jewish that helped us win the case, 
the uh, African Americans took with Marshall that sent in briefs along with the other people that sent in briefs to help in the in the Mendes case, the NACP, the Jewish Congress, the National Court Lawyers Guild, the American Civil Liberty and the, that came in and, and they all helped um, in Mendes. So students, for you that are thinking of fighting the cause, you will be helped. People will surround you. People will come and help you. And I have a question by one of your instructors here that say what what um what you should do after you choose a cause that you're going to fight for. Do not give up. Persevere in the street left. You have to stay and persevere because you're not gonna see immediate results. It's taken me twenty years and I'm still going around the country and people still don't know about Mendes versus Westminster. So just keep on uh, talking about it and helping. This month that we celebrate Latino Heritage Month, I'm so proud to be a Latina, born in the United States and continuing uh, living my American dream. But right now in the United States in education, we have Latinos. Only 1% out of the 150 have a PhD. Can you believe that? 1%. I don't know if it's gone any higher, it goes up to two, but sometimes it comes back to 1%. Is that not a sad? Is that not a So many of Latinos drop out of school. That's why I love to go and speak to them about education. So that's my main priority here that every, you are here, you made it. I am so happy to be in a university. You girls are here. You have finally gotten here. It is hard to get into a university sometimes. And so it's so important that they go to school. I have traveled like you saw all over the world for fun as a, as a nurse and found out that education is not free in other countries. What is keeping these Latinos from going on to college? going on to school. There's so many reasons why it is. So that's why I go and talk to them about Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendes that were intelligent, hardworking Latinos that had the courage and conviction, conviction to go on and demand equality, demand display bravery, and fight for human rights and recognize the importance of education. If they did it, why can't our students do it? And that is one of my main priorities going around and speaking in these respectful, segregated schools that we have right now that are doing so poorly with, uh, with the students going on to college. They have to know that they have the same opportunity as everybody and there's no reason for them to, to drop out of, out of school. So that's, I, I, I talk about this because that that's part of my heart to help them, you know, there's no reason for them not to. And it, it saddens me to see that what's going on with it. And then right now they say that our school, I live in California, and some of our schools are the pipeline, they call it, to jails. Can you believe that? Our schools, our education system, the pipeline to, to the jails. There's so many, so those students that are looking for causes, there's so many causes that you can fight for. And, and, and they're, they're there for me to champion these causes, the struggle that we're seeing right now. Yes, some see uh, Latinos as only supplements. They don't see us as decision makers. This is what Raul Vistadera states. They see us as consumers. They see Latinos not as producers. They see us as lawbreakers. They see us as tax expenditures, but not tax contributors. I say we have to change, you know, sorry, here we have to change that stereotype. That is not true. There exists under God is equal to anybody else. So that has to be changed. So my main concern right now is education for very late. And that's why I'm so glad I'm invited invited to universities. And I will continue with my legacy to tell the story, a part of American history where ordinary people were able to change the course of history. 
to encourage the students to stay in school. That's one of my sole, sole con con important, that's one of my sole, to, sole intents to convey the importance of education. That in this wonderful country of ours, everything is possible. It's not so possible for you students by this university to find a way to unite this country away again, because we are so divided again. And what do we, are you told when you graduated from high school? That you are future leaders. Were you told that? That you are a future leader. Students, when you were graduating high school, and now you've made it to the university, and some of you are graduating from this university you made. And what is it we are counting on you? to get us united again. What happened? Why did this country become divided again? So we're counting on you to get us united again, and that's what we need. Because we all deserve to have justice, and we all deserve to, to have equality in this country. And so I love coming to universities because I know that you are the ones that are going to get us back to where we were before, united, united, where everybody's working with everybody, everybody caring about everybody, everybody loving each other. That's what we need. I have some questions here from one of your professors. Stand up and say, This is wrong. We're not going to allow this to happen. 
I think what happened was that my father was an illegal immigrant when he was brought here to this country. Very young, he came very young, at seven years old, I think, and he went to school here. And he learned about the Constitution and the 14th Amendment, and he was taught that in school, so he knew, you know, that we all were equal and we all had the right here. I think that's what forced him to do that. Uh, I don't know how much time I have, but what happened is that my father went to school to the fifth grade, and then my grandmother took him out of school. She took him out of school and put him and sent him to work in the fields because she said we ran out of money and got to go work in the fields. So my father worked in the fields, uh, picking strawberries and, and, and oranges, and he hated that. He loved school. He, he, he hated that he had to leave school and go to work out in the fields. But he did, and then uh, he became very successful in, in Santa Ana. He became, uh, he had a cafe and, and, and was uh, doing really good, and the cafe was during the war, it was called La Cantina. I don't know, some people know what a cantina is, tell me here what, and food. But when this man came and told me, you know, the Mina Weasels need somebody to go take care of their farm. He left the farm to go take care of the farm for the new weasels. And then when he, he gets there, to be told that his children, that he loves so much, because I was his firstborn, was being told that they couldn't go to that high school. It just tore him apart. And then he remembered you know, everything he had studied in school and how he was not allowed to finish school. And now his children are not going to be allowed to go to, to a new school. It just, it just hurt him so badly, and that's why he asked somebody, well, you know, where do I find a lawyer, or what do I do now? Because he knew that he could find it in, in, a, in a peaceful, legal way that was fought, and nothing happened in California, nothing like what happened in the South happened in California. The only thing my father, that he came crying one day to my mother, he says, you can't believe what they're calling me. They're calling me a communist. They're saying I'm a communist because I'm, I'm trying to fight this case. And that was it. At that time in the 40s, to be a communist was terrible. We were being placed in jail. And, and uh, so that's what happened. But I think it was just all these things together is what made him decide to fight. I never did ask her that question, that's right. Because, you know, I was going along really good, and she always used to say, you know, I think your father, your father, after he fought, he used, she used to talk to me all the time. And my sister, who's 14 years younger, didn't even know about the case and learned about it in school. But she always used to say, see, I think that maybe a school should be named after what your dad did. I think, you know, we'd always be talking about it. I think that, look at how Sister Charlie's got all that praise and they don't even, they don't even say a word about your dad. That was my mother, talking about my mother. You know, she's telling me all these private little things, you know. And then all of a sudden when she gets so sick, she says, Zuma, you gotta go and do it. You gotta go and, and talk about this case and talk about what we did, you know. But she was always just praising her, her husband. And what happened was when, when we got to, when they were going to name the school, they were going to name it Gonzalo Mendez, and we had to fight for that because they wanted to name it after this person that had, had sold the land to, to the school, and we got a thousand names on a petition to petition it to be named after my father. And the women stood up and they said, this would not, not happen if Felicitas had not run the ranch and, and while you're, while Gonzalo's out there with the lawyer going around from city to city trying to get the other families to join in that didn't want to join in at the time. And, and uh, talking to the lawyers and the families in the, in the neighborhood that didn't want to go into the new school. They were happy with the school right there. They would put a, a, a school right in the middle, middle of the barrio and the kids had, all they had to do was walk across the street or one, one block. And, why, why, why is Gonzalo wanting them to go all the way over there, you know, to that white school? Doesn't he know the school's right here, you know? And so while he's doing all this and having meetings with everybody trying to get him to, to help him and to organize, 
My mother's running the, the farm with 40 acres of asparagus and 15 acres of tomatoes and the and packing house, you know. And so he could be doing all this. So everybody said, no, we have to have a, her name on the school. So before she died, uh, she knew that the school was going to be named. And by that time, she felt that, you know, it has to be told all over. And that's when she asked me to go around and talk about it. And I'm still talking about it, and it's still people don't know. We had another question all the way back. Hi, hello. Oh, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, what are your thoughts on the rescinding of DACA under the Trump administration? Well, when I heard about it, I started to cry. You know, I was a nurse. And what do you learn in, in nursing? You learn about empathy. So you put yourself in the position of these students that came here so young. Not knowing they were illegal, some of them loaded. Not know, not knowing how to speak Spanish, being raised as an American citizen, going to school, high school, and then going out to college, and then finding out, you know, that they're they're illegal and that they're not going to be allowed to stay there. I started to cry. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that he 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 would not allow them to stay here. But I know that they will be. Safe. Staying here, I have faith. I have faith in our system. I have faith in our Congress that they will be allowed to stay here because it's it's a very hurtful place if you put yourself in the students. And I'm saying, if one of my dad had brought me here illegal, what country would I be? My mother's Puerto Rican. Would I go to Puerto Rico or would I go to Mexico? And then when I got there, my Spanish was very poor because they, when I was growing up, they wanted to assimilate me into the American culture so they wouldn't even speak English, so I speak very poor Spanish. So what am I going to do when I get there trying to be you know, assimilated into that culture? So you try to put yourself in there. Well, well how would you feel? How? So when, when he did not allow that, it, I just started crying and crying. I just couldn't believe that, that this was going to happen. And when he said six months in the Congress is going to make a decision, I know they'll make the decision. We might have to put up a wall in the drain, <laughs> but I hope not. I hope that the Congress will come up and just say yes, allow those students here that are here, the DACA students. Hi. Um, what's some advice you could give future educators to help unite the country again? Oh, this, this wonderful university has all kinds of classes. We have diversity, inclusion. That's so important, you know. And, and I know that uh, other universities have this, where they're teaching you about inclusion, about uh, working together, and how important it is that we all go to school together, how we learn about each other, and to keep this country as great as it always has, it has been. And I think educators are the ones that are going to be the ones that are helping the students and have had in this university are helping the students right now. So it's up to the student now to take in what the teachers or professors are letting them know and to to go on and, and go on and help our country to become united. And how do you become united? By not being prejudiced, by not by not judging others, by not by not judging uh, immigrants. Everybody was an immigrant in this country. This country belongs belong to the Indians. And it belongs to the native. Yes. And so most of our people here are, are immigrants. So we just have to learn, you know. I think the teacher can answer that question better than I did. <laughs>
rights movement, but there was also uh, many, many Latinos working towards similar, uh, similar and in partnership with African Americans during the same time period. And that's kind of going back to your question is how do we get back to this space where we are working in partnership together for these big issues that kind of affect us all, like whether it's school segregation or inequality in, in ed education and things like that, and trying to reach across those things that um, we use to divide ourselves and recognize the things that we have in common, that the shared interests that we have as part of, of the United States of America. So maybe if we have one more question, anybody? You've actually answered most of my questions through the other questions, and also you guys asked questions that I was going to ask as well. So is there anything that you wanted to add that maybe we didn't think to ask, or? No, I don't think so. I think it's covered at all. It's just that, that in this wonderful country of ours, that we are so lucky to live here. And everyone believes what we can, We are allowed to say whatever we are, and we have all this liberty. And I always think of the Pledge of Allegiance, the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America. And I just love that because under God we're all equal and we all deserve to be treated equally. And I'm so glad that I was born in this wonderful country of ours. Thank you. Just a couple closing remarks. Um, on behalf of Multicultural Student Services, we thank a million times over Ms. Mendez for sharing her time, her wisdom, her experience, her story with us. So please give her another hand. Thank you. Thank you. And we also thank Dr. Jennifer Bunton, who always graciously partners with us during Latino Heritage Month. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>